Yeah, Polina. Welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas, our online public lecture series. Mina, Maggie Walter, Mina, Palua, Lutruita, Wisi, Waranti, Kani, Mapali, Milicina, Mina, Tunapri, Palua, Nigimpi, Nigumpi, Mana, Mapali. So in Palua Kani, I'm saying hello, my name is Maggie Walter. I'm a Palua Tasmanian Aboriginal person from Lutruita, Tasmania. And I acknowledge that we are meeting on Aboriginal land. I may pay my respects to the Palawa people, the traditional owners of this island, its skies and waterways, and pay honour to our elders past, present and emerging. So I'm also a distinguished professor of sociology here at the University of Tasmania. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce this um, Island of Ideas session tonight. And the Island of Ideas program is uh, designed to keep the ideas flowing during this period when we are unable to host live events. And I think it's, it's working really well. So each year as a university, we present hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars, and workshops free of charge for our students, alumni and wider community. And these are a very important part of the university's role. And it's why we're hosted forum, forums such as this this evening. So before we get on to our session, we just need to go through a few housekeeping notes. So first, you will have noticed already that your microphone, your camera, the chat function and the raised hand function have all been disabled. So our speakers are not interrupted. Um, we have quite a large audience tonight, which is wonderful, but it means that we can keep things moving along. But we do ask you to actually ask questions and you can do this at any time. So if you see down the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button in the function there. You can put your question in there. And um, when the speakers have finished, we will move to those questions and moderate them through. And finally, this lecture is being recorded so you can later access it on our YouTube and SoundCloud channels. So for tonight, we want to really make sure that we note that this is Social Sciences Week uh, and we're all here social scientists uh, on the panel. And it's a nationwide series of events held each September offering insight into the impact of the social sciences on our lives. So it's an initiative of the Australian Social Sciences Association. And this evening we're partnering with the Australian Sociological Association, TASA, to bring you a public forum on the very important topic of Black Lives Matter. So everybody uh, coming into the call tonight, you will be very aware of Black Lives Matter over the last um, few months, but remembering back that it was actually a movement founded back in 2013, uh, following the death of Trayvon Martin in the United States. So the point of Black Lives Matter is to uh, really um, focus on the disadvantages and the discrimination and the costs um, to uh, African-Americans in state and vigilante violence against black communities. So it started with the African-Americans, but it has since moved right across the globe. And more recently, it has been uh, dramatically recharged uh, through the worldwide protesters, protests over the death of George Floyd in Minnesota earlier this year. But tonight, our question is um, really much more specific, um, bringing it back to Australia and specifically to here to Lutruweta, Tasmania. So we ask, um, what are the daily threats faced by our black communities and how can the movement lead to positive change? So to answer this question, we've brought together a panel of University of Tasmania social science scholars to consider these dimensions of the Black Lives Matter movement. So the panel will specifically discuss Indigenous incarceration and police attitudes towards minority groups, the issues facing Indigenous communities around the globe and the various Australian contexts that this movement speaks to. So our panellists tonight are um, Indigenous fellow Jacob Prane, jo Dr Jocelyn Boltra gonzalez and Professor Nicole Asquith. So, to bring us, to get us started, I'm first going to introduce um, Jacob Prane. So Jacob is an Indigenous Fellow at the School of Social Sciences in the discipline of social work. He's an early career researcher and currently a PhD candidate exploring the question, 
what are the effects of bush adventure therapy on the health and well-being of Aboriginal men in southern Tasmania? His field of research is social work and sociology, and his research goals are to create equity for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. He is a forming act, former acting CEO of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Workers Association, NATSAWA, and has worked for Aboriginal health since 2010. He's also a qualified social worker and Aboriginal health worker. So can I introduce um, to you our first speaker, Jacob Prane. Thanks, Maggie, for that introduction. So I'm just going to share some slides with you all. And before I begin, I would also like to do an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the Munahina people who sadly, because of the effects of settler colonialism, are no longer with us. So as Maggie said, uh, my name is Jacob Prem and uh, like the rest of my Aboriginal family, um, I'm Waramai. So Waramai uh, from a area just north of Newcastle in New South Wales. Um, and my grandmother grew up on an Aboriginal mission at a small town called Karua. Um, but I'm very much part of the Palawa, the Tasmanian Aboriginal community here in Tasmania. So when I was asked to prepare for this event, I said to myself, what is it that Tasmania, Australia, the United States and the Black Lives, Lives Matter movement all have in common? Well, Tasmania, Australia and the United States are all settler colonial states. The fact that we need a Black Lives Matter social movement is because the lives of non-white people aren't given the same value as the lives of white people. Uh, which is in part because of the process of settler colonialism. So for those that aren't familiar with the process of settler colonialism, it is a structure. It's not an event. It's not an event that began when the British first planted their flag on Australian soil and illegally claimed the crown, uh, illegally claimed the land for the British crown using the legal doctrine of terra nullius. It did not finish here in Tasmania when George Augustus Robertson finished rounding up the Tasmanian Aboriginal people on his so-called friendly mission. Nor did it finish uh, in the United States when President Abraham Lincoln legislated emancipation in 1863. And it didn't, definitely didn't finish in Australia when the settler state became independent from the United Kingdom in 1901. So settler colonialism is a, ongoing structure and it has some central features which are really important to have a understanding of the debate or the discussion that we're having tonight around Black Lives Matter and what it is that Tasmania, Australia and the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement all have in common. So settler colonialism aims to replace the indigenous population with a population of settlers. Number two, in settler colonial states, settlers who are almost always white are viewed as racially superior to the indigenous population and others such as African-Americans. And number three, it is enacted using a variety of different methods. So these methods range from a violent depopulation such as genocide, which we've experienced right here in Tasmania and across Australia and throughout the United States to more subtle uses of the settler colonial state legal system to benefit settlers. So an example of this and what we're seeing with the Black Lives Matter movement stem from the way in which policing is conducted in the United States, Australia and other settler colonial states. The settler state uses its own legal system to justify its use of violence towards indigenous people and peoples of color. And we can see that in my next slide. That there is a culture of racial hierarchy which exists in the settler state and extends into its various institutions. So the next slide aims to highlight the racial inequality and the racial hierarchy that exists here in the Australian settler state and extends into its various institutions, such as police forces and prisons. So since we had the Royal Commission 
nearly 30 years ago, there's been 438 Aboriginal deaths in custody. So if you work it out, it's roughly 1.2 deaths per month or 14.4 deaths per year. Since the Royal Commission and its 330 recommendations, the Aboriginal deaths in custody have actually gone up 150%. So 41% of Aboriginal deaths in custody were organisations, settler colonial organisations not following their own procedures. 38% of Aboriginal deaths in custody were from medical care not being administered when it was required. In 2014, 25% of all deaths in custody were Aboriginal people, despite being only 2.8% of the population. So some of the Royal Commission's recommendations were arrest people only when, it, it, when there's no other way uh, to deal with the problem, which doesn't happen. It was to imprison people um, only being utilised as a sanction of last resort, which doesn't happen. Police officers and prison officers should seek medical attention immediately if any doubts arise to a detainee's condition. And as we can see, if 38% of deaths are from medical care not being administered, that doesn't happen either. So police and custodial officers have a duty of care no matter what an offender has done. Which leads me on to my next slide which is actually some from some of my own research uh, with Aboriginal men here in Australia and comparisons to non-Indigenous male population in Australia, but then also comparing these to the Kansas countries, which are a collective of what's well, an acronym used for um, a group of collective first world settler colonial states that have primarily been colonised by the British. And so these states are Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United States. So this helps us to understand settler colonialism as being a structure that occurs across a number of states and um, uh, where, where am I? Oh yeah, so as we can see from, from those, uh, from the slide, there's a big overrepresentation um, from the Kansas countries in the indigenous males being incarcerated and also African-Americans being incarcerated at a rate which greatly outweighs the respective percentage of the male population. So we can either say that coincidentally, uh, there's four groups of Indigenous males and African Americans that are genetically disposed to committing crimes, or we've got some really bad dudes in all of these countries, or the explanation that better fits the data is that the structure of settler colonialism, which exists in these four states and is being experienced by these indigenous people and African-Americans. So the way policing is conducted in Australia and other settler colonial countries is an extension of the settler colonial state. Settler states use the legal system as justification for their actions, actions against minority and racial, minority, racial and ethnic groups and settler state police and custodial violence towards indigenous people, along with the everyday settler violence experienced by Aboriginal people is part of racial terror that is central to the process of settler colonialism. The settler narratives of the uncivilized, the primitive, violent, deviant and dysfunctional indigenous persons and persons of color forms part of the justification for this continued violence. White settler violence is aimed at these imaginary threats and then flows through to institutions such as police forces and embeds itself in everyday professional practice. So this is why the Black Lives Matter movement is relevant here in our settler colonial state of Tasmania and why it's relevant in the settler colonial state of Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, 
for your very, very interesting and informative um, presentation. So our next uh, speaker is Joss, Dr. Jocelyn Boltra Gonzalez. So Joss is a lecturer of social work at the University of Tasmania. She's originally from Chile. She came to Australia as a refugee and has dedicated her professional life to working with people of refugee background. Her work and her research passions relate to decolonizing social work, transformative, disruptive social innovations. You've got to love a bit of transformative, disruptive social innovation, sustainability, post-sustainability, and the deep adaptation agenda. She is amongst a group of Indigenous and First Nations scholars across the globe who conduct research with a decolonisation agenda and with a focus on learning from Southern knowledges. Thank you, Joss. Thank you very much, Maggie. Um, good evening, everyone. I would also like to acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and evolving. Um, my contribution tonight is a little bit more personal and it will take us to um, South America for a little while before I talk to you about um, the, what I was asked to talk about, which is how um, do Indigenous and First Nations people see the Black Lives Matter movement. <clears throat> so my name is Jocelyn Baltra Gonzalez and I identify as a female. I'm a social worker academic living in Australia and I came to this country as a refugee. Uh, my mother was Euro-Chilean, the daughter of French and Spanish migrants, and my father is an Indigenous Mapuche man. His mother, my grandmother, was taken at birth from her Mapuche family and was raised by various Chilean families in the occupied Mapuche territories of Chillán. Our Mapuche heritage became the great, heavy and unspoken shame of the family until we came to Australia and we were able to speak of who we were. In 1996, I traveled back to Chile and began my reconnection with my people and my culture. The rest, as they say, is history, a painful history, as I am Mapuche and I have not yet found my extended family. I am connected to a Mapuche community in the Mapuche territories of Nueva Imperial in Temuco. I have learned culture, rituals and language there. My family and I contribute from Australia. We are considered part of there are many versions of the history of the Mapuche people, um, but basically the Mapuche stood against the Spanish to protect Mapuche territories for 270 years. When Chile broke from, the, from Spanish rule in 1810, the Mapuche as a sovereign nation fought side by side with the Patriots, the generation of Euro-Chileans seeking independence from Spain to declare Chile an independent nation. In 1880, the Chilean government invaded the Mapuche territories. They seized ancestral lands, placed people into reservations, isolating communities from one another and replacing rights to ancestral lands with colonial notions of land ownership. Once colonial systems were in place, rights to ancestral lands um, what, what followed pretty much mirrors the experience of all other colonized first peoples forced removal from ancestral lands, forced removal of children under assimilative policies, entrenched racism, poverty, incarceration, loss of freedom, loss of culture and violence. Today, the struggle to regain sovereignty continues. And then in the last 18 months, there's been a resurgence of violence against the Mapuche nature, nation who have headed the Chile has awakened movement fighting the enormous racism and inequality um, brought about by corruption, neoliberalism and transnational abuse of power who continue to seize natural resources, cutting forests, damming rivers, you name it, they've done it all. There are about a million and a half people in Chile who identify as Mapuche, half of them live in urban centres in Chile and in exile, and the rest remain in and around the, their ancestral territories, mostly in southern parts of Chile. And I've got some pictures that I want to share with you. Um, <clears throat> of when I was there last year, um, hope, hoping you can see them, of what the struggles look like. Um, some of these pictures we took, um, these are my people fighting for freedom. Um, and um, also the Chilean community fighting from freedom, for freedom from neoliberalism. Um, 
the assault by police in the Mapuche territories is rampant. Um, I think the, speak, the pictures speak for themselves. So um, the Black Lives Matter movement is therefore very personal to me and my family. So when I was asked to speak about what this movement means for Indigenous and First Nations peoples across the globe, the first thing I thought was this, this is a personal story I will be sharing. You see, the Black Lives Matter movement highlights for Indigenous and First Nations peoples just how much this game many call progress is fixed. There is no fair play. It is fixed because Indigenous peoples live in societies codified by policies, laws and worldviews of the settler society. Our ways of life are considered periphery, relevant only to a few. The Black Lives Matter social movement highlights just how broken the social contract is. For Indigenous and First Nations peoples, we have had hundreds of years of living in societies where we are not heard, we are not seen, and if we are heard and seen, we are heard and seen as troublemakers, crippled by primitive cultures or as a group of people who in the white settler colonial psychic are different and need help. This passively accepted narrative about Indigenous people being different, needing constant help, defines us and has become sometimes the only currency that gets us traction in institutions like universities. When George Floyd in the United States cried out, I can't breathe, he described the indigenous people's lives. Indigenous peoples across the globe haven't been able to breathe since lands were taken. Centuries of racism, colonization and brutality isn't something that can be analyzed anymore. These are our families, our communities, generations of people who die young, who suicide at twice the rate of any other population in the world, who no matter what they do, are never treated as equals to the white settler. We have needed to distinguish our lives as indigenous First Nations, just so white people can see us, see our struggles, see us alive, when you have to distinguish your life in that way, you know not all lives matter equally. Black Lives Matter isn't an important movement for First Nations and Indigenous peoples. It is the most tangible way we have to speak back to whiteness. The most visible way we have to dream of equality and give voice to our lived experiences. Maine Wyatt, Australian actor, Aboriginal man, said it best during his monologue in the ABC's program Q&A. Indigenous peoples are tired, tired the world over, tired of accepting what has happened and continues to happen to our peoples, tired of having to be silent and subservient, tired of stay, staying in the lane where we can bring up, where we can't bring up the issue of race for fear of white fragility. Moving forward is a privilege settler society's privilege because for indigenous peoples and first nations it's centuries of oppression daily acts of microaggression and complicit silence even from people who empathize black lives matter is about decolonization collective decolonization a call to join hands in the struggle it's not enough to tag the course post the petition or use the hashtag we need people to join us in the lived experience of the daily struggle. No one is free until we are all free. That is Black Lives Matter. It's all of us feeling in our hearts the need to see our brothers and sisters free from racism. It is institutions like this university teaching students to unlearn white supremacy. It is indigenous knowledge and science being respected and taught as mainstream in its own terms, unfiltered by settler epistemology. It is systems and people directly confronting racism in all its forms. It is people using their privilege to return what has been stolen. Making room for indigenous people isn't enough either. Not if the room, not if the room is yours and indigenous peoples are merely, merely a visitor you tolerate. 
we need to build new houses together. No master and apprentice anymore. We do and we change together. A new story with a new narrative around a treaty and sovereignty for First Nations. Being uncomfortable while we build this new story is part of the deal for settler society. And it will not mean danger for white people. You are well protected because indigenous peoples are not seeking revenge, we are seeking equality. Undoing centuries of colonization isn't going to feel warm and fussy either. It's going to hurt. And each of us has a responsibility to take, off, to take care of that hurt. Black Lives Matter as a social movement isn't going to hand over the answers, the recipes or the formula to draft a new social contract. We each have to do the work to figure out how we decolonize. We each have to show up, try and fail and learn from the mistakes to try again. Indigenous peoples are tired of showing the way. The answers come from all of us working hard to undo the damage. Black Lives Matter makes us all accountable to the open wound this country carries, the open wound called racism. It lies at the heart of how this nation came to be a territory taken from the First Nations peoples without a treaty, without compensation. This movement is a mirror we don't want to look into, but we must. We must see what we don't want to see if we are all to have the privilege of moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joss. Uh, can I remind people to put in your questions as you go into the Q&A box? So put them in now as they occur to you, and then we will open them up to the panel uh, when the panel has finished speaking. So I want to introduce you now to our third speaker. Uh, our third speaker is Professor Nicole L. Asquith. So Nicole's a professor of policing and emergency management, and she is also the director of the Tasmanian Institute of Law Enforcement Studies. Her work focuses on vulnerable people and the criminal justice system especially in relation to policing practices. Before returning to the University of Tasmania, Nicole was the Associate Professor of Policing and Criminal Justice at Western Sydney University and Senior Lecturer at Deakin University. In addition to her academic roles at UTAS, Nicole is the Co-Director of the Vulnerability, Resilience and Policing Research Consortium. She's Secretary of the Australian Hate Crime Network and a convener of the LGBTIQ Domestic and Family in Violence Interagency. So thank you. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks, Maggie, and thanks for the opportunity to contribute to this uh, conversation. I'd also like to uh, take time to, to thank Jocelyn and, and Jacob for providing a really important context, a, a lived experience context, to our discussions about Black Lives Matter and its relevance to Tasmania and Australia. As I am currently not in Tasmania, I'd like and uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Darug and Gandagara peoples in Kolomara, which you would most probably know as Blue Mountains. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to other First Nations people uh, participating tonight in this webinar. I'm a second generation white Australian woman from a settler culture. I wanna preface my comments tonight by saying that it is not my position to justify or defend any police actions, but nor is it my position to critique indigenous strategies for addressing the disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system on First Nations people in Australia. Instead, I wanna talk, I wanna take this opportunity to talk about the opportunities that the Black Lives Matter movement has, has given rise to in Australia as well as globally. Most of us present uh, this evening would know that Indigenous Australians have been disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. From encounters with the police at the front end of the system right through to incarceration at the back end, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are over-policed and over-punished. As with policing in the US, this overrepresentation of First Nations people is not an aberration. The system of policing we know today was founded on the colonial military system, which was primarily tasked with controlling two populations, 
transported convicts and Indigenous peoples. But when push came to shove, as was the case with the Black Wars in Tasmania, the military was able to overlook their need to control the convict population if it meant that they could better control the Indigenous population. Colonial states such as Australia cannot ignore this legacy if we are to enliven justice in this country. So rather than spend my allocated time rehearsing the trauma, genocide and damage done to present and past First Nation communities, I want to consider how Black Lives Matter, along with COVID, can provide us with the necessary break from business as usual. Only two years ago, I uh, began writing a book that I knew that would be contra controversial because in that book, I sought to map out a world without the need for police. At the time, I was skirting around these ideas of defunding the police or abolishing the police, primarily because the audience wasn't there yet. But fast forward to 2020 and both concepts are now mainstream and being discussed and debated around kitchen tables. If nothing else, the Black Lives Movement has created the conditions for all of us to think differently and think otherwise about policing and criminal justice. For researchers in the Tasmanian Institute of Law Enforcement Study, this break from business as usual is a welcome impetus for us to broaden and expand our work in the area of law enforcement and public health. As any critical criminologist will tell you, the causes of crime are rarely found in some innate propensity to commit crime. Additionally, critical criminologists would tell you crime is not a fact. Rather, it is a set of processes, social processes, based on decisions made by the powerful that criminalize predominantly the lives of the powerless. As such, crime is not, is, as, as such, crime is a symptom of the underlying dysfunction in the structures that inform our, act, our actions, including economic justice and political systems. Responding to the symptoms as causes and responding with highly apparelled police officers may in fact deepen the inequality and trauma experienced by First Nations people. Identifying and resolving the wider issues of poverty, disenfranchisement and dispossession upstream before they manifest as criminal behaviour downstream will go a long way in addressing some of the overrepresentation of First Nations people in the criminal justice system. Indigenous led, and co-designed strategies for preventing crime, along with the legal power to apply traditional law to the problems faced by First Nations people are, are necessary first critical steps. The police as we know them today have only existed for 200 years. At the time of its inception, modern policing was created as an adjunct service to industrial capitalism and the expanding empire. It was a system of control designed around the norms and beliefs of white powerful men. It was a system never designed with the interests of indigenous, migrant, female, queer or disabled bodies in mind. Now, while policing has valiantly attempted to, uh, over the last three decades, to reform the system to account for the interests of others, the same issues continue to arise time and time again. Perhaps it is time to reconsider both the architecture and the intent of policing, rather than continue to hope that piecemeal reforms will compel a more just system. And as with other systems created to bolster industrial capitalism 200 years ago, the capacity of policing to meet its remit is increasingly tenuous. Even for all of us, the situation is, is dire. Only 53% of all crime is reported to the police and in only 5% of those cases is someone found guilty or pleads guilty. And as um, Jacob has pointed out, there is a higher proportion of those people who uh, identify as First Nations. Despite increased funding and an increased remit, policing may not be the right medicine and may no longer be fit for purpose. But in the time between now and what some would call a utopian goal of a world without the need for police, there is much to do to transform social and economic relationships that inform our sense of criminality.
As such, we still need the police for a while. And yet we cannot wait for Nirvana to change the overrepresentation in the criminal justice system of First Nations people today. Piecemeal reform in the here and now with our eyes fixed firmly on that horizon of a better world is critical if we are to make a dent in the number of First Nations people detained, punished, and at times killed by our injustice systems. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Thank you, Nicole. So audience, you've um, heard from three uh, speakers who have put very uh, different points of view, but also there is a coherence of the argument and each of them has been what we call ontologically disturbing. So to actually shape out and actually challenge people to think about things differently. So I'm gonna to go to the chat now, but before uh, for the questions, so that there's, um, I'm going to start with this one to answer. So you can now should be able to see this. It says um, a question for any of the panel, and I think I'll ask all three of the panel to address it. How do empathetic white Australians engage with Aboriginal people such that they do not end up in a wasteland set aside for do-gooders where they arouse suspicion in both of the white and black camps? So, um, can I ask perhaps uh, Jacob to start first and then to Joss and then to Nicole to answer that question? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Peter. Um, I think relationships are really important. So um, that's probably the social worker in me talking a bit as well. But um, yeah, just having uh, open and honest relationships um, with Aboriginal people and perhaps uh, reflecting on um, uh, you, yourself and um, maybe uh, areas like your workplace and whether or not um, that workplace is um, continuing the process of settler colonialism over Aboriginal people. Um, so, you know, things like reconciliation action plans can be useful for settler colonial institutions to embed within their organisations to begin undoing some of those structures that are in place. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's about all I've got to say. Do you want us just to jump in, Maggie? Yep. Um, I think absolutely I agree with Jacob. Uh, the key to it is, is relationships. Um, build genuine relationships with um, Aboriginal people, with First Nations people, and do the work with yourself first. Um, and extend that work to your family, to your loved ones. Um, you know, take take them along to to get to know people, to build those relationships. And don't ever stand by um, when you witness something. Um, you know, if if nothing else, you can you can always stand with someone. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. But if you're if you're seeing racism in action, if you're seeing uh, that those kinds of aggressions, um, stand with people. Um, don't let it go um, un unaddressed. Uh, but relationships, the key to all of this is relationships. From my perspective, I think the most powerful thing that I learnt in, in working with and alongside Indigenous populations is to be quiet, to listen, to listen to the stories that are being told and not to try and change that narrative so it suits your perspective. Exactly. Your views exactly. I think um, the other thing is to also be open to having really difficult conversations, not only with Indigenous people, but also, as Jos says, with your family and friends as well, but also difficult conversations with yourself. Um, I was recently, well, not recently, in 2019, called out um, in a, a forum where uh, I was perceived as having engaged in performative allyship and it was a difficult conversation for that person to raise it with me but in the 12 months since that time I've also had those difficult conversations with myself about what am I doing that is authentic and contributing rather than just being a performance. 
Thank you. That's it. Gives us a, a good um, place to start. But we've had a couple of questions along those lines. I think probably we've still got a few questions to go. But um, I think just before I came on tonight, there was uh, another uh, Aboriginal woman died in custody today. Um, I'm just trying to get the questions down. <laughs> um, and I think that um, Nicole's point about and the, the, a lot of the argument from Black Lives Matter around defunding the police, I, I want to ask the panel to actually talk about what an alternative might look like. And, I, and the other thing I would bring in just at the moment is that this just this very week that Torres Strait Islander uh, methods of parenting have been officially recognised in Queensland. Um, and I think this is the first time ever in Australian history that um, ways of being and ways of doing things other than um, the sort of Anglo or European model has been positioned as a, an appropriate and officially recognised. So if I could ask the panel, perhaps to start with Nicole this time, um, as a policing expert, to talk about if we didn't have the police, what would what would it look like or what could it look like? We've had some really interesting research come out in the last 12 months that shows that 84% of calls to the police are not crime related. So we now know that there's 84% of the work that we've assigned to the police that can actually be assigned to other um, organisations, other services, other government departments. I think that the, the strongest um, work that's coming out of, of policing and criminology is a work around law enforcement and public health and looking at the ways in which allied health services can actually address the issues much earlier before they become an issue of criminality. Um, there is a concern though, uh, particularly from critical race uh, scholars in the US, that we don't just replace police officers with a um, a rigid system of social work that is as controlling as the police actions are. So it is about the decolonization of those allied health services in order that what we go forward with isn't just changing the name of the people who are looking after the problem. Thank you, Joss or Jacob? Um, I know that some of the things that have been working okay uh, where I'm from um, is this um, mirrors a little bit the, the idea of a sociocracy. So um, localizing action, um, going back to smaller groups of, you know, smaller communities taking charge of their lives um, and running, running their, uh, their main business, um, everything around their lives. That has worked quite well in some communities. But again, the government needs to be able to step back and allow that to happen. So allow um, land to be returned, allowed people to make decisions about resources on that land. Um, so that there's something there. I think we, we could look at systems around sociocracy that could work quite well. And that means localizing uh, efforts and decision-making. Jacob? Yeah, I don't really have too much to add to that. I think um, Jocelyn and Nicole did a really good job of answering that. Okay, I'll go to another another one of the questions that has been asked by the audience. Um, so this one um, asked about, have there been police prosecutions and or convictions following deaths in custody? And uh, again, I will open it up. I can see that Nicole's got an answer. So perhaps again, we'll start with Nicole. <laughs> No, there haven't been. Um, there's a, a case currently um, underway at the moment in, I can't remember where it's actually cited now because there was discussions about where the, the case was to be heard, um, which was in relation to the death of Kumajai Walker. Um, there's also possibly a, a prosecution that may stem from um, the death of an Indigenous woman in Western Australia as well. Um, but no, there's, there's been coronial inquest after coronial inquest, um, which shows you that 
the, the, the police weren't charged in the first place, leading to the coronial inquest. And even from those, there has been no recommendations to, to charge and prosecute um, either police officers or correctional officers. Yeah. Joss or Jacob, did you have anything to, to add to Nicole's response? Yeah, I just that it's unbelievable that, you know, nearly 450 people can be killed and um, you have a Royal Commission before that happens and um, not a single one has been convicted. Mm. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, that on its own, um, how were you not outraged? I think there was a, a piece um, printed just recently. I'm just trying to remember who the author was in the conversation that says, how can there be so many people dead um, and no perpetrators? I, th I think we also acknowledge that the police also are within the system. So it's not a, 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 a sort of a, a all police are bad idea. I just want to go to this um, question from Mike Coffin, which Again, to the panel's um, own expertise, expertise and experience about some of the best practices around other Kansas countries, whether it be in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Canada, in the US, etc. Yeah, I'm not a criminologist. Nicole, you might be um, better to answer that one than me. I really want Giles and, and Jacob to be uh, more, more dominant in this discussion, but of course policing and criminal justice is something that almost everybody seems to think that they're experts on. And so it is a, a common theme in elections and, and discussions about crime. And, and most people don't actually realise that they know almost nothing about policing and what actually happens in policing and the criminal justice system. I think some of the, the better strategies are in line with what Jos was talking about in terms of putting back and giving autonomy and agency to small communities to make decisions about what happens within those communities. And I think particularly for Indigenous communities, it's about handing back ownership about safety and wellbeing and reframing it as safety and wellbeing, not policing and security. That is, it is a holistic understanding that it's not just about the end product of a, a criminal act, it's everything that leads up to that and, and dealing with those in a holistic way. And I think in the current state of this colonial settler state, that needs to be wholly owned and led by Indigenous people because white Australians still have not got the capacity to sit back and listen and to work with the Aboriginal people in a way that, that matches their beliefs and customs and norms. So I think in the short term, it is actually about giving up control. Yeah, I, I might add to that. In, in my area of research, which is health and wellbeing, um, comparatively to the Kansas countries, the Sami, who are the Indigenous peoples to Northern Scandinavia, uh, Interestingly, in Norway, the life expectancy is nearly on parity with the non-Indigenous population. And I wouldn't be surprised if the incarceration rates of Sami in those Scandinavian countries is a lot closer to the non-Indigenous population. And so some of the key features of the Scandinavian countries, which just seem to be great at everything, um, are that the Sami have their own parliament, um, we don't have a parliament in Australia. We don't even have a treaty. Uh, the Sami are a lot, oh, sorry, the Norwegian nation state is a, a social democracy. We're a liberal democracy. So we're more about the individual. And coincidentally, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States are also liberal democracies. So rather than the collective well being of a society or a state, um, liberal democracies are, are focused on the individual. And then the third feature 
is uh, the willingness of the Norwegian nation state to sign up to international conventions like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, who, again, the four countries that didn't want to sign up to it were the Kansas countries. So Norway has actually legislated a number of, of key outcomes from um, UNDRIP, which is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which doesn't actually contain any additional rights. It spells out how human rights apply in an Indigenous context because they're broken that often. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and uh, the wonderful um, Christy Cooper lets me know that Amy Maguire wrote the piece I was just speaking to a minute ago. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to give open up one of these slightly controversial questions we've got, and I'm going to throw it to Jacob. So the question is, is alcohol a problem or a symptom for First Nations people? That's a good question. Uh, put me on the spot a bit. Alcohol a problem or a symptom for First Nations people? Um, I think when you... Um, I mean, alcohol is bad for everyone, right? When you, you drink too much of it. A, a few drinks on a Friday night, that, that's not too bad. But when, um, when you're systematically oppressed and uh, your health and well-being is constantly under attack by structures that you have no control over in the society or the community in which you live, then you're more likely to... Uh, self-medicate with substances such as alcohol or other drugs um, to make yourself feel better. So is alcohol a problem or a symptom? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a problem um, because uh, Aboriginal people are needing to self-medicate um, from the daily um, ways in which they're treated differently and marginalised. So either Joss or Nicole, do you want to comment on that question? I would say it's both. It's a problem and a symptom. Uh, and I agree with Jacob. When, when people are oppressed and generationally oppressed, so they have, they have a story of oppression um, and they know oppression is almost part of their, what they expect out of life, then they're going to turn to things like alcohol to relieve some of that pressure. Um, so it's, you know, the chicken or the egg. It's a hard one, but um, we need to address all of that, all of the problems at every level. It's not just addressing alcohol as an addiction, but also addressing the problem of uh, oppression, of colonization, and the ultimate problem of not having a sovereign nation, a community that can dictate its own path I'd also add there, just to, to cut in a little bit, that while alcohol is certainly a problem in, for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are statistically much, much less likely to drink than non-Indigenous Australians. So the presumption that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people drink is part of that system by which well, we know a lot of people have been arrested as being drunk when in actual fact they had medical conditions and sometimes that presumption and assumption cost those people their lives. So I'm going to go to this last question. Uh, this is from Megan and it goes, is funding Indigenous-led healthcare, education, housing, etc., within the existing government system a waste of time or is it a good starting point? you got to start somewhere. <laughs> um, if, if it is within the current systems of governance and governance, governments and governance, um, then we need to put in um, provisions to ensure that Indigenous voices are the dominant voices in the development of those strategies, that they are at the table from the, the moment the thought is, is, is created in a bubble right through to its implementation and evaluation and development. 
if you put those, those measures in place, then irrespective of the form and function of the, the government itself, then you're enabling those local communities to have control over their own lives and lived experiences. Yeah, I second that too. It's gotta to be in Indigenous terms and not just the outcomes or the processes, but the entire thing, the entire thing from the get go. Hand over and, and let people do their thing. Yeah, the, the data from Aboriginal community controlled health services uh, is, is really promising. So um, Indigenous led uh, health services get some good outcomes because they begin to address health and well-being in a way which Western systems, which primarily take a biomedical approach to health and well-being, well, not even well-being, it's just your physical health or your mental health, um, which uh, from my own research um, doesn't address uh, how Aboriginal men conceptualise their own health and well-being. So there's a whole other domain that's not being appropriately addressed by mainstream health services and until such time that mainstream health services cater for Aboriginal people, um, yeah, we need Indigenous-led health services and community-controlled health services. And I just wanted to add there, Maggie, sorry for, for adding extra to that, but in those circumstances where Indigenous communities have control over their, their safety and crime within their communities, crime plummets almost overnight. So it's not just within the health sector, it's also within criminal justice sector that when you hand over control to our First Nations people, they actually have the solutions already. We don't need to provide, white people do not need to provide any more solutions. Those communities already have the solutions. We just need to enable them. Thank you. Look, we're almost out of time, but I am just gonna read um, this one from a uh, response, a question from Liz Ellens, or actually I'll put it up there um, for people who are interested about the, um, the Inuit insights into alcohol and impact on people in the Ar Arctic. But as we call to a close, I just want to have ask everybody to thank, um, we have to do it silently, of course, um, our wonderful panel tonight, and to, to say that I think it's been uh, provocative, but also a very well-informed and well-reasoned uh, panel. And I'm hoping everybody who's been on the thing will take something away and think a little bit differently about the Black Lives Matter. So this evening's talk is um, finished. <laughs> is uh, available on the video and podcast and the Island of Ideas, and we're looking forward to seeing you at another event. Thank you.